And we've made the case before that transport can occur in two flavors. One is conservative, which we talked about for the last three sessions, which really just means that all the fluid that gets dissolved into water uh, and carried downstream stays dissolved in water uh, and is not allowed to be removed from the, the fluid that's present in the system. In some materials, uh, sorption occurs onto the grains that it flows past and because of that it's actually physically removed from uh, the water phase being dissolved in water and actually physically attached to the static um, porous medium that it's going through. And that's especially prevalent in things like uh, coals, which aren't very often um, uh, aquifers for the things that we would talk about. But it often happens in uh, clays, which sometimes are. And also it happens on really quite inert things like sandstones or sands, which are really just quartz, the same as uh, glass, basically. And so it happens to different degrees in different uh, materials, as you might imagine. And so what we might do today is talk about um, non-conservative transport. So I guess this is really uh, code for that. And these two things that can happen in that are retardation and attenuation. So uh, retardation really means that the arrival is delayed downstream. And attenuation means that when it arrives, it may be in a concentration that is smaller than uh, the upstream magnitude, or that, that it would be otherwise if it wasn't um, absorbed into the system. So we're, we will talk about uh, non-conservative um, non transport, reactive transport, I guess, under some measures. Um, so where do we start with this? Uh, is it worth, yeah, actually that's, um, I sometimes miss doing things on the board and so maybe we'll start with a new complete new note and do it so let's do it almost from scratch and talk about this all right so um what's the easiest way to do this so non-conservative transport But, and we will follow the stuff in the notes, but I just want to take a, a deviation from that. You'll see the things that I'll write down embedded in the notes if you prefer to go along uh, with, with that. Uh, but I just want to do it slightly differently. All right. So you've, we know that uh, the expression that we're dealing with uh, has this form. It's a partial differential equation. And we don't really need to worry too much about the individual terms in terms of their mathematical sense, but more about what they uh, mean. And what they physically uh, can be interpreted as. So this is, uh, if you like, accumulation. This is by uh, dispersion. And this part is due to advection. Often referred to the advection dispersion equation or advection diffusion equation. Um, and we can think about this in terms of uh, really just a conservation of mass equation. We conserve mass. And these components are um, the amount that gets, that accumulates. So in other words, uh, if we were to look at these two different parts, accumulation would be uh, a mass rate in and a mass rate out. Recognize this term, uppercase M dot. And the mass rates are driven by diffusion. So in other words, you stick the bead of uh, ink in the water, the concentration changes, it physically transports, the halo moves further out. So if you take a control volume around that halo, the mass of the ink 
will actually travel across that boundary, so it's going outside this control volume. So it can go out by dispersion or diffusion, and it can go out by physically being advected if it's carried downstream. And the difference between mass in and mass out into this control volume is the amount that's accumulated. And so what we will look at today is an extra term, and this term represents uh, sorption. And the individual terms of this are, uh, I'll define them in a second. And so uh, rho d is the bulk density of the aquifer. Theta is moisture content, not moisture, but moisture content, which is just, um, if you like, the volume of water over the volume of voids. And so the maximum value of this is between zero and porosity, right? So theta has to be less than porosity and has to be less than or equal to 1. Porosity typically is something order 30% um, in porous media. And the other important component here is C star is the uh, concentration I think I've spelt that with too many T's concentration I'm not holding this pencil right today on the solid. So it's whatever is dissolved in the fluid, which is traveling downstream, but it's the concentration of that compound that's physically on the solid substrate that physically isn't, isn't moving. And so one way you, you could uh, deal with that would be that you could take a, a beaker and you could put into that beaker that has a, an aquifer in it in some way and you could put in some concentration of water uh, that has some component in it within the water and you could see how much ends up being sorbed onto the solid grains that are present in there. And the basic idea is that if you looked at the concentration change as a function of time change colors just for the heck of it. And if you look at the, the concentration that is present on the grains as a function of time, then you might see that it would do something like this. So it reaches some equilibrium concentration after some small amount of time. So you like this amount of time that it takes to do this, to be small, so it happens instantly, you could think, I guess, in the limit as you uh, squeeze this uh, magnitude around. And so if you put in some stuff that is double the concentration, then you'd expect this to do, well, I'll, let me draw two of them that happen roughly at the same time. So let's say this first. So this is at C1, and this is at 2 times C1. Then if we did this and we measured the concentration that's present within the, um, on the solid in this beaker, then we could think of doing, actually we could do the, the figure right here. Let's see if I can just do it extended across here. And if you looked at the concentration on the solid, but now plot it versus the concentration in the water, so this is in the water, and this is in the solid. And we have these two, I'm going to do it very fantastic. It's probably more elaborate than we need to. Uh, these are the two concentrations. But the basic idea is that if we end up, oh, 
if we end up with these concentrations that represent the concentration in water and the concentration on the solid. That are these two points. So in other words, we put some fluid in, has some concentration, and it reaches some equilibrium concentration on the solid. We double the concentration in the fluid and we double the concentration in the solid. Then the, the line that joins those, we could define in terms of a change in concentration on the solid versus a change in concentration in the water. And we could draw something as we're used to doing in other arenas that looks like this. Not a very good. This term here is called K sub D, which is called a distribution coefficient. And so if we follow this, then this would just be KD divided by 1, right? So there's similar triangles for these two. So concentration on the solid, concentration on water, given here. I guess we could get rid of the differentials for changes, and we could just write it in terms of a change in the, the concentration on the solid versus a unit change in the concentration in the liquid that's supplied. And so that's useful to us because what we'd like to do is we'd like to be able to account for everything we've done so far has been defined in terms of the concentration of the stuff in the liquid, which is what we're interested in. If you're sucking water out of an aquifer and drinking it, it's C, uh, not C star that we're interested in. And so what we could do is we could rewrite this expression here by multiplying this term, which represents uh, sorption. So this is the loss due to sorption. Loss of dissolved mass due to sorption. And we could do this little trick where we just multiply this by a change in concentration of the water divided by a change in concentration. By one, in other words. And so if we now rewrite this expression here, this expression would be rho d over moisture content. And if we just rearrange these so that we write these two together and the other two together, we end up with dc star dc multiplied by the change in concentration in the water with time. So this whole expression is written in terms of concentrations in the water. It happens to already have an accumulation term which represents how much mass is arriving in that control volume in the water. And you could think of this as a, a, a term that represents how much of that mass that's arrived within the water is actually being taken out of the water and plastered onto the static substrate, the grains, which aren't then moving. And so if we rewrite this in here, I won't do that, and uh, actually just let me let it... If we now rewrite our expression, uh, we end up with this. Change in concentration with time, which is this. I'm going to move this expression on the left-hand side, plus density, bulk density, over moisture content, multiplied by, well, this term here. And this term here we have already defined as being equal to this distribution coefficient, which is a, a material property. So this is KD. And it's equal to the terms on the left, right-hand side. The dispersion coefficient multiplied by the second partial of concentration with distance, and the advective term, which is the advective velocity in the x direction, and the change in concentration in space. And so the reason in writing this, of course, I missed out to put this. I shouldn't have left this out. DC dt. And now we have this term and this term, which are identical. And so what we could do is we could just rewrite this as 1 plus this term. We can gather these two partial derivatives, 
which are the accumulation term. And the right-hand side of the equation shouldn't change. Diffusive term and also uh, the advective term. And so the reason for writing it this way is that now this, this term here that we have is referred to as the retardation coefficient. And if we wanted to write this out in shorthand, I suppose we could do just by pre-multiplying the left-hand side by R. Accumulation term is equal to dispersion times diffusion. Sorry, this is diffusion, rather. And advection. And if we wanted to be fancy about this, what we could also do is we could just divide everything through by this retardation term. In which case this term here goes to 1. And so that's it. So if we're accommodating stuff that gets uh, plastered onto the grain so it's no longer mobile, then we can incorporate it by this um, extra term, which represents that, which is really just a, a sink for stuff coming out of the flow that goes onto the solid, which is then no longer mobile. And we go through a slight manipulation uh, to get this. And now we really have an equation, if we then actually write it as we had before, it looks exactly the same as our advection dispersion equation, except for the fact that If I just do this without these terms, except for the fact that it has these different terms, which instead of just being uh, dispersion, it's now dispersion divided by r. And instead of being advective velocity, it's advective velocity divided by r. And so we can deal with it in exactly the same way as we've uh, dealt with it using the equations we from two days, two periods ago, I guess, from 3.2. One dimensional within core and three dimensional as a cloud moving in a porous medium. And all we have to do is we have to use changed um, parameters which represent slightly different uh, rates at which this will occur. And so I suppose if we apply it to our very, uh, our generic example, where we look at a, a core between upstream and downstream with some advective velocity along it. Um, I suppose some length of the core to the external point. And these figures that we've drawn across the la last period we did anyway, we talked about what the concentration would look like as you go from upstream to downstream, uh, depending on the upstream boundary condition of the concentration changing with uh, time. And I guess on the downstream part, again, C over C0, and again, 1. And so I guess we know that for the boundary conditions that we have that look like turning this on at some time, then the plume would look like this in the case that uh, longitudinal dispersion is zero. And it would look different, I guess, if it was finite. And I guess we get the same behaviors on this. The breakthrough would either be a, whoops, would either be a kind of a heavy side function breakthrough or it would be a, 
one that's diffuse. Uh, we know when this, this isn't always true. We talked about that at length last time, that it's not always true that it goes through the 50% location, which is here. This is a half, and this is zero. But this is for the case where this magnitude is equal to this. But what this is saying is that the rate at which this travels through the system is now uh, delayed. It's retarded by a certain amount. And so the effective velocity is really just reduced by a factor. So if we look at um, velocity being equal to length traveled in a given time, then the length traveled is actually, I suppose, um, reduced so because of this. Is that going to be right? The velocity... Uh, no, I'm not sure that is right, actually, is it? So now it's moving slower. So the velocity uh, will actually be reduced. It's reduced to this amount here. And so if we want to calculate the time taken for it to, to travel, then the retarded solute will move like this. And this length it's traveled is going to be equal to, just from this, is going to be equal to the product of velocity times time. And so the length is going to be equal to the velocity times the time taken. But now the advective velocity, instead of being the original advective velocity, is actually reduced by some amount. And so if we use this reduced velocity, this will say that it hasn't gone as far as we otherwise would have gone. So the transformation is relatively straightforward uh, in that we're looking at this advective part, and it's gone less far than it would have done otherwise. And this, I guess, is a universal condition that we could use because for this particular case here, so this is, uh, conserve, this is R equals 1. And okay. So if, the if there's no sorption occurring, then physically what would that look like, I guess? It would be a flat curve, right? So in other words, no matter how much concentration there is in the water, none of it gets sorbed onto the solid. No sorption. So in this particular case, this curve 1 over KD, the value of KD would basically be 0. KD would be 0. And if this KD is 0 here, then by definition, this equals 1. So R has to be less than, sorry, greater than 1, and I suppose less than infinity, whatever this value is, depending on the magnitude of this. And so that's the range of uh, the retardation factor. And so if r is 1, then we can also use this as the length traveled is equal to the velocity time divided by this. And this just happens to be 1, and it'll give us exactly what we want. If it is retarded uh, as it goes through the system, then it'll be delayed by some amount. And it's, if this is equal to 2, it'll go half as far in a given time. If it's 4, it'll go a quarter as far, etc. And so what, does it, what will it mean for this case here? I guess if you do... Uh, think about exactly what it is. If it's going slower, then what do we say about this particular Time will be equal, just by manipulating this, will be equal to length over velocity. And velocity, if we substitute then, velocity as being equal to velocity divided by retardation. If retardation is 1, then it's still the velocity. But if we substitute it here with a value of r, then I suppose this would be that it's equal to length times retardation divided by velocity. And so that means that physically, this breakthrough curve for the purple one would be somewhere to the right. right? Do it here. And so I suppose the, the important thing are that the ordinates that we might want to use are going to be that 
it's it'll be traveling less quickly because it's being sorbed it's being taken out of solution and sorbed onto the substrate which is static and so it, the front moves less fast than it would do otherwise and because it moves less fast in terms of breakthrough it'll take much longer for it to get there uh, and so the bottom line is that the expression that we'd like to be able to represent is this expression and the physical explanation of it is just exactly the one that we, we gave right now and so there's no reason why we can't also use the equations that we use but we just have to use instead of uh, dispersion coefficient we divide it through by retardation and instead of advective velocity we also divide that through by retardation and if we do that we should get the right results and so that's perhaps the, the simplest exposition of, of what's going on in this system so it's very I, I think reasonably straightforward it follows the notes exactly um, if I find them just to go through it that's just a recap of what's going on this is exactly the figure that we looked at before the fact that this sorption should occur quickly and it should come to some equilibrium point and if it comes to some equilibrium concentration then if we double the concentration in the water then presumably this sorbed concentration should also double but the key is that it happens instantaneously um, the processes that we're talking about represent both adsorption and absorption and they're subtly different adsorption means that on the, the faces of all these grains whatever the solute is physically gets attached just to the face and doesn't penetrate inside the, uh, the, the medium but absorption means that it physically not only gets sorbed onto the face but actually intrudes into the interior and gets taken up into the structure within it as well. So subtly different, but the, the mechanisms are basically the same. So, uh, and if you look at this expression here, this is the term that we just introduced with the appropriate uh, relationships. Um, we represented this sorption, rate of sorption onto the solid, which we have in this extra term here. We want to make it look like the same concentration that's in the water. And the only way we can do that is by this uh, slight manipulation of just multiplying both sides by 1, dc over dc. And if we do that, we end up with the expression we have. What we did do was we assumed that it was always this equilibrium sorption behavior in the top. And I suppose from your other classes, you might know that that's not always the case. Sorption isn't always uh, linear doesn't always keep on going that if you keep on doubling the concentration you double the amount that's sorbed onto the uh, solid and there are a couple of other ways of, of writing it either as a Freundlich isotherm where it's just a power law um, dependency again with a distribution coefficient for when this is equal to one uh, it would be linear behavior but when it's great to less than one it would be this flat response and if it's greater than one it would be this power law response or perhaps the most famous one is uh, a Langmuir isotherm, which is similar to th this Freundlich isotherm when n is less than 1, and is physically just given by the fact, I mean, physically it represents the idea that there are only so many sites that things can be sorbed. Once you've sorbed enough stuff onto it, you can't sorb anymore because you've filled up all the available sites. And so this is quite a, a well-known uh, isotherm that represents sorption onto carbons, activated carbons and other things, where you sorb a lot of material onto it. But that's that's basically the same thing that we went through. Um, the derivation here is exactly the same. This is the retardation coefficient. It just acts on this uh, accumulation term. And this figure down the bottom is exactly what we just drew. This would be the profile of concentrations that we get from using these two different uh, terms. A modified dispersion magnitude is going to be reduced and a modified advective velocity. And so you can rationalize the fact that in conservative flow, so I guess this is conservative. Then you expect to get this spreading of the front. This may be 50% or it may not be, as we know. But if this is what the front looks like when it's uh, conservative, then 
when you transform it to look as non-conservative or attenuated, there are two important features. The first is that the front is delayed in going through here by this amount here. So this is always equal to or greater than one. And so this will be proportion. So if it's a retardation of factor of two, this will be half as far as this point. But the other thing is that it's also reducing the dispersion, right? And we know that dispersion is the main agent by which it ends up being canted over at this angle instead of being vertical at this point. And so by the same reasoning that if you reduce the dispersion coefficient, you go from this plug flow to being diffusive flow, you'd expect that when you also shrink this to go less far, it would also be much sharper. And so it's changed from being this diffuse flow to progressively being sharpened by the fact that you have this retardation attached to it. So those are the two characteristics of what are going on. And so I guess those are just mentioned in these two parameters here. Okay, so that's it. Um, by far the most usual sorption behavior is linear, in which case um, the ratio of concentration on the solid to the liquid is a linear, linear proportion. Um, and so that's the only one we'll deal with. Um, and I guess we see it in reality uh, in field data. And so these are field data um, that are for two different materials. So we didn't spend very much time on it last time, but we mentioned it. And we mentioned this experiment at this particular site in uh, Canada, Canadian Forces Base Borden, where a bunch of uh, these experiments have been done by uh, putting solutes in the ground at some location in a flow field and it being a soft and high enough aquifer that you can physically sample it by just putting pushing capillary tubes into the ground to be able to get these pretty complex um, contour maps. And these are what the plume looks like from doing that sampling after 85 days. I guess you need to know the direction of the hydraulic gradient to know exactly where you should look for it. And some estimates of the, the, the head gradient and the um, permeability and the porosity so you know whether you look for it here or whether you look for it here after 85 days so you can find it. And so these are just measurements for chloride which is a non-sorbing tracer as it went over two years, almost two years, to travel downstream. If in the cocktail that you mix at this upstream location you also put dissolved in water some other components, and in this particular case the two components are carbon tetrachloride and tetrachloroethylene, PCE, uh, and you look, at, look for the plumes of those components after a year and two years for these final two points, you find they haven't gone as far as the, the, the chloride solution because it's been uh, delayed because of uh, retardation. And so what you could use, just from what we've talked about, is the information for, if you plot after two years, the data for the chloride plume, which has gone furthest from previous, carbon tetrachloride, which has gone less far, and tetrachloroethylene, which has gone even less far, then you should be able to use our ideas of what we've talked about to be able to figure out exactly what uh, the values of these two parameters are, right? There's two parameters that we have that make up this expression. One is the value of this retardation coefficient uh, in the first place. And once we have this retardation coefficient, the physical property that defines it to be able to define it. And so if we wanted to figure out what the distribution coefficient, we could get the field value by trying to figure out exactly what R is. And once we know what R is, so long as we know the densities and the porosities, if it's saturated, we should be able to equate the uh, R value with KD. And so we can do that pretty straightforwardly. So uh, retardation is basically, in a physical sense, equal to the um, velocity that is um, conservative 
divided by the velocity, which is non-conservative. And so uh, we know that also that velocity is equal to length traveled per unit time. And so if we take the same unit time for each of these, then the length traveled should be proportional to the velocities. So in other words, this should also be, this is length conservative and length non-con. And so if you do it after two years, this should be 57 divided by 23.5 in meters, which is about 2. So in other words, for carbon tetrachloride, oops, I'm going to run out of C tet, is this magnitude. And if we look at the value for uh, retardation for PCE, it's going to be the same two lengths divided by each other, NC and C. NC is not going to change. It's 57 meters. And in this case, it's traveled much further, which is 13, which is of the order of about 4, right? Something like that. And so we can immediately get retardation coefficients from that. So I suppose if we extrapolate that, if we looked um, in another two years' time, this would have traveled 114 meters. This would have traveled uh, 47 meters, right? And the same uh, ratios would exist. So retardation in a physical sense is just defining that. So yeah. So if you look at the actual values, if you do the real calculation, it's not 2 but 2.4. It's not 4, but 4.38. And so with that information, if we wanted to, we could go back and be able to calculate the magnitude of KD, the distribution coefficient, because now we know what this value is. And so long as we know something about the characteristics of the aquifer, uh, its density, its porosity, and, its, uh, and this is the parameter we don't know, we should be able to figure it out. And so the other thing that we can do if we wanted to is we could calculate just by taking retardation coefficient. If we rearrange it into KD, uh, what would we do? I guess we would um, take retardation. We'd subtract off 1 from one side. And this would be equal to KD. And if we multiply this whole thing by uh, moisture content, and divide by bulk density, This we should end up with this expression here. That's all we're doing, just rearranging it in terms of that. So now, if we know what retardation is, which we do for each of these, if we know what these other properties are, uh, typically a porosity, if it's saturated, then this would be equal to porosity. And the porosity is typically of the order of a fraction, uh, 0.2 or 0.3. Uh, the bulk density of an aquifer, I'm not sure what we've used here, it should be of the order of 2,000 kilograms per meter cubed, something of the order of 2,000 kilograms per meter cubed. And so if we know each of these properties, we can say something about the distribution coefficient, which we calculate here to be 0.213 and 0.507 um, in milliliters per gram or liters per kilogram. Strange units, but, but nonetheless ones that make sense just from the units that are here. Yeah, so, so this is a unit, and this is going to be units of uh, mass divided by volume, and this is unitless, so mass divided by volume 1 over is volume divided by mass, which is exactly what this is. And we can calculate what those are. And so we won't do it today. We can also figure out exactly what the Efficiency by other means for some of the, the, the materials that we're interested in, um, and we won't do that today, uh, but we can use that to compare with our <coughs> calculations. And that's about it, I think. Um, yeah, okay. Right? So, so the point is that if we're looking at non-conserved flows, all it physically represents is that it comes out of the water, it goes onto the solid substrate, and once it's on the solid substrate, it's moved from the flow field,
And so when you sample the water, it's not in the water anymore, and it's done, uh, and it's, it's delayed it. The other thing that we didn't suggest here is that we would also think that, uh, perhaps it's not so obvious, but because a portion of the mass has been attached, then the value of this concentration as you go downstream might actually be slightly reduced because no longer is the same concentration present in there. Uh, but I guess that's not quite the case. Certainly the analytical solutions would tell you that this uh, concentration is equal to, uh, relative concentration is equal to one. So you should be able to, if you go back and, and look at any of these expressions that we have dealt with, the most uh, in-depth that we've met, dealt with was this one, I think, right? Everything that we've done here, we have defined in terms of solving this equation here. But in reality, what we've said is that if we want to solve it for something which is retarded, then we have this extra term on the left-hand side. And so if that's the case, then we can merely reduce the values of these advective velocities and dispersions by dividing them through by this factor to reduce their magnitude. And so if we call this, for instance, I suppose, uh, not d star, let's call it d over bar, and <coughs> pardon me, and v over bar, then the expressions that we should use in this equation here would be this and this and this and this just by modifying it and of course if there's a velocity divided by length they'll cancel out right because they're both divided by r so it won't make any difference here it will make some difference here because it's not just a straight division and it will make some difference here by this and I suppose in this case if you're talking about the Peclet numbers, the Peclet number you use should be represented by those. So this actually will be unchanged, right? Because V over R times L divided by D over R will be completely unchanged. So the Peclet number won't change. But I guess this... Um, time magnitude will because this will be v bar and so what you'd physically expect is that you'd work with exactly the same Peclet number in the system that, that hasn't changed by virtue of the fact that it's retarded or unretarded but the value of this pore volumes will change because this value v sub r or v over bar is equal to the actual advective velocity divided by r. And so what this will physically do is just exactly what we showed before is that since this is a number that is greater than 1, it will change this so that um, it will, is that going to be in the right direction now? So this is VTR. So now the magnitude at which this occurs is this. Yeah, okay, so this. So if it breaks through at one pore volume, then what that would say is if this term, let me write it out here. So if TR is equal, it looks like it doesn't work, make any sense, but it does. I guarantee it. So what this is saying is that this is the property that we're representing. If we're saying that breakthrough occurs when this equals one pore volume, TR equals one, then physically what this means if we rearrange this to get it in terms of time, then it means that time will be equal to TR length retardation over velocity. So this is equal to 1, say. Length is the place where your compliance point is. Velocity hasn't changed, but retardation, instead of being 1, is now bigger than 1. And so the time taken for it to break through, it will always physically look like this. But if you plot it out in terms of 
real time and not poor volumes, then the conservative plume will break through whoops, here at time t conservative. And the non-conservative time will be multiplied by uh, a factor. And so this will break through here. Yes. And so initially we said something about the time taken is proportional to length times retardation divided by advective velocity plus u. And so if r is 1, then this is just length of velocity, the definition of a velocity of, of time taken to get somewhere, right, if you drive by car. And if retardation is larger than this, then it stretches it out. So it seems from this that it doesn't make sense because you're dividing through by r, and it seems that this time gets less. <coughs> but that's not the case. This is a, a dimensionless time that represents a poor volume when it comes out of the system, and as a result of that, in real time, it kind of stretches it. So, so you can use it. I mention that because one of the test questions kind of relates to this, and so you might want to look at that. Okay? In past tests. Don't know if it's this year's test, but it certainly was passed. All right. So the bottom line then is that we can use all of the expressions that we've already used to be able to figure out what retardation coefficient is uh, just by a physical description of what retardation is. And if we know what retardation is, we can also say what this distribution coefficient is. I guess the final comment to make, I think it's the final comment, yeah, is that we said that this is due to sorption. And so we made the case that um, linear sorption, double the concentration in the water, you double the concentration that's sorbed. Uh, or it can look like um, uh, Langmuir sorption. But there are some other mechanisms that are sorption-like. So in the same way that we talk about diffusion in water, uh, Brownian motion and being a diffusion coefficient, and also mechanical dispersion, being diffusion-like, because if you look at the source area where you introduce the ink and the downstream location where the ink has all gone through the pore space and spread out into this Gaussian cloud, they look like diffusion, but clearly mechanical dispersion has nothing to do with diffusion at all. It just looks like it. And so there are processes that aren't sorption, but they look like, dis like sorption. And one of these is this. So if you look at rock which has a fracture in it, and this fracture has clay or granite on either side so that none of the fluid that goes within this fracture is able to uh, escape into the material around it, then you'd expect that if you look at the concentration profile as you go downstream from this point, it might look like this red curve here. And so that is that there's a front that's gone a certain distance. Up to that front is basically a uniform concentration because everything's been trapped within the system and hasn't been allowed to escape. So maybe now you can look at another case where now instead of this being clay or granite, this is sandstone that has some porosity to it. And if it has some porosity to it, then the solute that is dissolved in this fracture, in the water in the fracture, can also diffuse into the water which is next door to it, which happens to exist stagnantly, if you like, within the pore space of the, of the wall rocks which are present next to it. And as it diffuses in here, you'd expect that it would kind of, diff if it's there for a short period of time, it would only diffuse a small distance. Here it's been here longer, it's had longer to diffuse, so it would diff diffuse further into it. So this mechanism, if you like, is just like sorption because it's taking the, the mass that's dissolved in this water and it's distributing it, it's losing it to this water that happens to be stagnant within the pore space. And so with this, if you look to the, the profile, you'd expect, one, that it would go less far. So the, um, the front has gone less far in this amount of time. And it's also kind of attenuated because the magnitude of this uh, concentration, the, the height of this, is also reduced because some of the mass has gone in here. If you now allow the stuff that goes into the pore space 
not only to just diffuse in the water, but also to be itself attached to the quartz that is present, that's also stagnant in that pore space. Quartz isn't moving at all. Then you get a double effect. Not only does it go in by diffusing in the water, but it gets attached to the pore space that it's, it's flowing past, and by flowing past it and being removed, it actually won't go so far. It's another retardation. It's being retarded in the, uh, the porous medium. And so in that case, if you like, there's a double loss. There's a loss to the amount that goes into the water, and the stuff that's in the water then goes into the solid from the water and is lost to the flow as well. And so in that case, you'd expect a double effect. Not only does it go even less far, but it's also kind of uh, attenuated as it goes along here. This is just looking at the concentration along the length of the profile. And so it's quite common to see these kinds of sorption-like processes in fractured rock but aren't, like, aren't completely sorption, but they end up looking like sorption because the net effect of what you see in terms of the concentration distribution in the flow field, and I guess by uh, inference, if you drew for each of these the other final curve, right? So in other words, what the curve would look like with time versus concentration, then what would they look like? So this one would arrive quickly, and so it would look like this, I suppose, right? This would be number one. This one would look like this. And this one, I guess, would look like this. So they'd be equ equally delayed, I guess, in, in arriving at the, the downstream point. And so they aren't really uh, sorptive behaviors, but they start looking like sorptive behaviors. I suppose the other side of this, and I'm not sure that I discussed this, don't worry about that equation. Um, the other side to this, of course, is if you are sorbing stuff onto the matrix, uh, and all of a sudden you're not introducing new um, uh, components that are uh, dissolved, uh, components that are actually carried in the water, then if you flush it with uh, clean water, then the reverse behavior happens, right? The sorbed stuff that's attached to the grains will come back out of being sorption because now it's clean water that's going through it. It will get entrained in the flow field, and then it will give you a secondary pulse that goes downstream. So sorption always seems like it's a good deal because it reduces the concentration of the mass that's going to arrive downstream, and it makes it take longer to get there. But I suppose all things sometimes come with some cost, and that would be that if you've cleaned out that portion of the aquifer to be able to remove the source material, and you have a lot of stuff that's sorbed onto the, the mineral material that you're now flushing clean water past, then it will desorb from the substrate, go into the water, and now it will give you a signal that gets carried downstream uh, that you'd be able to, to see and which you wouldn't necessarily like. And so, so I guess that's the, uh, the double-edged sword of, of all of this. The one thing that we didn't talk about here, and I'm, I won't do it today, I'm going to quit early today, because I think we can, uh, is that we can also make these calculations for how much is sorbed and what that effect that would have on the groundwater flow system, uh, not by doing this calculation that we've just done by looking at the two velocities and how far the plumes have gone, but by looking at the magnitudes of uh, the characteristics of the individual solvents themselves.